The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Help us to grow in the knowledge of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and to remain firm in the confession of his blessed word. Give us the love to be of one mind and to serve one another in Christ. Then we will not be afraid of that which is disagreeable, nor of the rage of Satan, whose torch is almost extinguished. Dear Father, guard us so that his craftiness may not take the place of our pure faith. Grant that our cross and sufferings may lead to a blessed and sure hope of the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for whom we wait daily. Amen. That is Luther's prayer for growth. You can find it inside the cover of your Lutheran Study Bible, an excellent one to accompany our study today with uh, the suffering we endure but not giving way to unbelief. We'll definitely finish with in chapter 5. So go ahead, grab a handout, grab your Bible. This is our penultimate First Peter study. Next week we'll get chapter 5, the conclusion of the book. And then Pastor Johnson will take over with uh, Second Peter and Jude, kind of mixing them together a little bit. So, 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I love it when we have that in church, too. It's part of the lesson and you all just can't help yourselves. It's a good thing. So we do get a new section in this epistle, moving from the ministry of hope, where uh, Peter teaches us how to suffer, not for doing wrong, but for righteousness' sake. And now we move into the section on the sobriety of hope. Now I know for Lutherans, sobriety is kind of a, a buzzkill word. Looking at that side of the Bible study room over there. <laughs> Sobriety is a good thing. Be sober-minded. It's all over the Gospels. It's all over the Epistles. Uh, so, caveat once again. Of course, the Bible is not anti-alcohol, as some uh, churches would teach. Jesus creates wine for the wedding at Cana. Psalm 104 says that God creates wine even to gladden men's hearts. So even the effect that it has on us can be a good, godly, first article thing. But with all good first article gifts of God, what is the danger? Idolatry. Right? Receiving it as a gift, used in moderation, used in accord with what God intends it for, it's a good thing. Letting it control you, evil. Right? An appetite is a good thing. Gluttony is a bad thing. Being thirsty, a good thing. Drunkenness, a bad thing. Even our natural appetites for man for wife and wife for man are good within the proper God-given order of a marriage. Taken outside of where God orders it, it's a bad thing. So here too, as Peter teaches us to be sober-minded, we should take that both literally and spiritually. Literally in the sense that, yes, Christians are to be sober. That does not mean we have to be full-blown, teetotaling Baptists who never touch alcohol at all. But we should not then abuse that freedom and become drunks. Right? There's a lot we could learn from the temperance movement of the prior century, uh, including why they did what they did. It's actually not too different from our modern um, opioid epidemic. When you actually look at the history of what was happening that prompted that movement, it was bad. Something had to be done. You can quibble about the way in which it, it happened. We can all celebrate the repealing of, the, of whatever amendment that was. 
But, you know, it, there were problems. And we, too, have those problems today with drugs and alcohol and uh, the common denominator there being your mind leaves you. And that's where drunkenness is so bad, especially for Christians, because it affects your cognition. And we are to be in control of our passions and always in our right minds, as we heard a couple weeks ago, always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you. How could you possibly do that when you're stumbling over your words and probably tripping out the door of a bar? Not possible. Right? So these, these calls to be sober-minded are not just the figurative, uh, be ready. Right? Sober-minded meaning be clear thought, you know, have clear thoughts. No, it, it quite literally means stop getting drunk. Right, stop getting yourself to the point where you are a worthless couch potato. All right. Martin Franzman opens this section, this section with uh, this introduction. The approaching end of all things calls for a sober vigilance in prayer, a life of love and mutual ministry to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. So that's a good summary of these uh, five verses. Verse 7, Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Once again, for Peter and for the church, the end times began with Christ's incarnation. We saw this even in our book of Daniel study, where there's a lot of apocalyptic end time stuff. It begins with Jesus' incarnation. In specific, the end times begins when he ascends into heaven. And we have the promise from the angels he will come again just as you've seen him. This is now the end. John talks this way in his epistles, the end is now, and so Peter as well. In fact, we've already seen that in 1 Peter 1, verse 20, where Peter says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. So the time when Christ appears, that's the last times. Right? The last age of this world is from Christ's incarnation to his reappearing in glory. That's the end times. All right, what connection or risk is there to your prayers when self-control and sober minds are absent? Right? If he's telling us to be self-controlled and sober-minded, he tells us it's for the sake of our prayers, what's the connection? Yes, Mike. We stop praying when we lose control and when we're not sober. Or, more likely, you fall asleep on the couch because you've had a little too much to drink and you don't finish your evening prayers. It's one thing to fall asleep while you're praying out of exhaustion and despair like a child crying in its mother's arms. God loves that. He's a father, after all. There's nothing sweeter than the baby falling asleep in your arms even while she's crying. But if you're falling asleep in your prayers because you had so many beers that you're just, you know, passed out, you've deadened your senses to the world, that benefits no one. Right? So that's what we are to avoid. Yes, Nancy. So could that be uh, could that be extended to allowing your mind to worry and render you a couch potato because you're so involved in thinking about other things and, and not really going to God in prayer with them, but being distracted? By worry and anxiety? Good question. So she's asking about, I have to repeat everything for the camera because it'll pick up my mic better. So the, the gist of the question, if I can uh, wrap it together, is what about anxiety and worry and those things, which often can, if we fixate on them especially, uh, overrun, you know, not go to prayer and winds up, you know, leaving us passed out on the couch from sheer exhaustion and all sorts of other things. It can. But we also ought to take those concerns and prayers to God, right? So when Jesus teaches about not being anxious or worried about tomorrow, that tomorrow will uh, worry about itself, that's a good teaching. And we worry warts need to learn more about that to take it to God in prayer. Too often, worry and anxiety is the form of prayer, right? We don't actually take it to God. We have a need. It's a real need. We're never downplaying that need. But that real need then uh, only prays in the form of self-worry, self-concern, anxiety. 
Uh, so it could be the same. I wouldn't wrap it together with uh, sober-minded or self-controlled, per se, because uh, it's usually stuff that are out of our control. But to actually take those things to God in prayer rather than simply worrying, allowing them to overrun us. What else? Anything? Self-controlled, sober-minded, how does that affect our prayers negatively? I heard somebody also mention selfishness. Yeah, that, that can be true. What if the self-control is over your temper, and you're not very good at controlling your temper? How hard is it for an angry person to pray for the person they're angry with? Pretty hard. In fact, in premarital instruction, that's one of the reasons why we t constantly tell couples to regularly pray with each other and for each other out loud, because it's very hard to be angry with someone that you are praying for regularly. But the inverse is true, too. If you have no control over your temper, it will affect your prayers. Because that passion, that negative passion, ends up driving the silence. Right? The bitterness and contempt that you have for the other person leads you to say nothing to God on their behalf. All right, so let's continue on. Verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, that's an allusion there, too, to Proverbs 10, verse 12, love covering sins. Why is mutual, continual love amongst Christians so important in general, or particularly as the end approaches? What does love do? How does love cover a multitude of sins? This is very important that we not fall into mushy, phony, modern versions of the word love, as we talked about a couple weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 13, where love is just sentiment and emotion. In that kind of way, it makes you think that love just doesn't see the sin or overlooks the sin, maybe even tolerates it, permits it, and grants it a seal of approval. That's not love. If love is something that covers sins, then now we are in the language of forgiveness. Forgiving sin, taking it to Jesus, who shows us what love really looks like, dying for sin, wiping it out. Now that's a kind of love we in the church can talk about. I think I, we'll get a little more of this as we go through verses 9, 10, etc. But I want us to think about this in particular uh, as a pastor who keeps you know, his ear out on, on other churches and how the church in general is doing. I think if an extraterrestrial were to land his spacecraft, I shouldn't assume it's a he. You know, there could be extraterrestrials that are neither male nor female or something weird like that, right? Uh, Kang and Kodos from The Simpsons land their extraterrestrial spaceship on the earth right now and listen to 50 sermons from 50 different churches, what would they think right now the most important form of love is? In the churches, I'm not talking about the culture, which we know has a whole different doctrine of love wins. What would they think right now is the most important thing based on what all the churches are preaching about in terms of love? There, I've loved my neighbor. Didn't forgive anyone's sins. Didn't call repentance forth for someone who has sinned against me. Didn't point them back to Jesus Christ for the sins that they've committed. It may be a good thing. I'm not sure. I'm kind of agnostic on the science of it. But to make that the only way in which the church talks about love, that's words that I can't say in Bible study. You caught that. <laughs> I mean, honestly, there are, obviously there are good ways to love one another, care one another, uh, approach each other's physical needs and all that, but we are missing what the church's love is really about because we're distracting ourselves from Christ's love and turning it into... All sorts of very small human things. Uh, and the fact that the church itself can't seem to keep straight what love is in reference to forgiveness of sins, absolution, communion, baptism, that's, that's lamentable to the extreme. 
and, and just the alternative is so superficial, it's not explicitly Christian. I don't listen to sermons from Muslim mosques or Jewish synagogues, but if they said the same thing, would there be any difference? No. They probably are preaching the same thing, I'm assuming, unless they're more doctrinally focused to their own scriptures. But that's all you ever hear. That that is love. And if you're not doing that, you're not loving. Well, forgive me for thinking that the priorities within Christ's church are towards granting an eternal healing, an eternal salvation. Again, I don't know much about science and medicine. I do know a lot about Jesus' death and resurrection. And one of those two actually matters eternally. One doesn't. As a couple missionaries I know have said, uh, why are you wasting your time giving malaria nets and eyeglasses to people overseas when what they need is eyes that open in eternity? Eyes of faith. When they don't need protection from mosquitoes as much as they need protection from the devil and all of his false doctrine. Right? Let's get our priorities straight. For what the love that we in the church have to share and give is truly about and not get lost in superficialities, which may be true, but they're still superficial. Right? That's not Superficial doesn't mean false or unreal. It just means not as deep. Not as deep as what we need. All right, verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. What would grumbling do within a church and within uh, the realm of hospitality as well? Isn't grumbling a form of idolatry? Because you're Explain. thinking you're so important that you have to, you know, do this for somebody else. Good. That grumbling can be idolatrous because you're putting yourself ahead of someone else's need, particularly someone whom God has placed in your life. Good. What does it do to a whole church? Since Peter's writing to a church, not an individual. Show hospitality rather than grumbling. It divides it, breaks it apart. Most importantly, it's the exact opposite of how Christ behaves. And so, in the realm of preaching the gospel to the unbelieving world, those lost in error's darkness, it gives them the exact opposite of opinion. Right? The hypocrisy. And throughout First Peter, not only has he said, don't give way to morally bad behavior, but we should also be concerned about hypocrisy, that we would preach the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ, the free forgiveness of sins, the baptismal washing and regeneration, and then treat each other like dirt. That's going to speak volumes. But rather, especially in reference to forgiving and covering a multitude of sins, if you forgive someone's sins, treat them like they're forgiven. Don't continue holding it against them. Right? Let's not get our heads around verse 8 and covering a multitude of sins, then forget all that when we get to hospitality and make it just about coffee and donuts. It means when you've forgiven a sinner, treat them as forgiven. Right? If a, uh, to use the example from 1 Corinthians 5, if the man who was having an illegitimate and evil affair with his stepmother repents, which he did, then welcome him back into the church. You don't continue treating him like a adulterer and an incestuous adulterer at that. If the absolution is proclaimed, then welcoming them back in, that hospitality, is definitely more than skin deep. Why would any other sinner assume that their sins are actually forgiven if here you've announced the public absolution of a public sin, but then still treat him like a public sinner? Yes, where there is unrepentant public sin, it must be publicly rebuked. But when it is repented of, that too has to be made public. And the way you treat that person better match. Right? It better match. If that person is absolved and standing before God's people as a forgiven sinner, then you better treat him that way and not grumble that he has to be present here too or whatever else they're grumbling about. Uh, there's plenty of examples of grumbling in Scripture and also in the New Testament, saying what an awful sin it is. 
How bad is it? We just saw it a couple weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 10. It was listed right up with uh, adultery and idolatry in the people of Israel who were leaving Egypt. Go to 1 Corinthians 10 quickly, and we'll just see that, uh, that chain of events. And most importantly, this will prove that Nancy was correct, that it is a form of idolatry, because it's in the chapter on idolatry. I'm here for you, Nancy. <laughs> chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10. Now, going back to verse 6, these things took place as examples for us, all the things of old in the Old Testament, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. It's Exodus 32, the golden calf. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Gee, you think we'd have a little less adultery if people were dropping dead at that rate? 23,000 in a single day? We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the age has come. See, Paul also says it's the end of the age, the end of the world. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. <laughs> Verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So serving one another uh, has been a theme throughout 1 Peter, going all the way back to chapter 1, where it is highlighted that the prophets served us. Chapter 1, verse 12. When the prophets wrote down what they wrote, it was in service to us here today, who would read their word and believe in Christ, that they served us, and so now we serve one another. How? By pointing everyone back to that word, the word of forgiveness, the word of life. We serve one another in the household of God. That's why he uses the language of stewards. It's a word for a household servant. Uh, for those of you ladies who have watched Downton Abbey, and the men who don't want to admit that they've watched it with their wives, uh, you have plenty of examples, then, of stewards, butlers, servants within a house who are doing what the master has given them freedom to do. It's not abject slavery, but there are parameters. Whatever the butler's name is, he cannot provide you know, more than what they have given him permission to do. And he's to do with what he has what he's supposed to do. So... The final thing I wanted to point out was that the, uh, there's a word play here between gift and grace. Charis and charisma. So he says, as each has received a gift, charisma is the Greek word. It sounds a lot like an English word. So, as each has received a charisma, a gift, let him use it according to God's very grace, charis. So God is the one who gives all grace and all gifts, and we are to use that gift according to his purpose. And his purpose is to forgive sin, to cover it, a multitude of it, to bring people into this Christ before the time is up, because it is the end of all things at hand. Verse 11 then. What two gifts does Peter highlight? The times when Paul does this, he might pull out four or five different gifts within the church, but Peter only highlights two. What are the two gifts that he highlights that we ought to use according to God's very grace. Speaking and serving. Good. In that, in that way, it shows uh, the distinction or the, the close connection between word and deed. The one who is preaching God's word ought to treat it as if it is God's word and not his own. And those within the church who are serving ought to serve with the strength that God supplies. Right? Word and deed are both coming from the same God. They ought to be in accord with one another. Nancy? Kind of summed up the uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.24, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Good. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. 1 Corinthians 10. 
1024. Thank you. What is the goal, then, of the proper use of these gifts? The speaking and the serving, being in accord with each other. What is the goal that he gives? In order that, should be your clue, right? That's a purpose clause that tells you why the writer thinks this thing is important. So why? What's the end goal? What's the importance of speaking or as oracles of God and serving with the strength that God has given us? What's the end goal? Soli Deo Gloria. You Lutherans ought to know that phrase. Soli Deo Gloria, to glorify God. That in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. All right, we've got some time. Flip the page. The end is near, and we ought to suffer because that unites us to Christ and gives us joy. Now, as you'll see on your sheet uh, down at verse 14, I have a. There's a little addition. There's just one little phrase that's added, or not added. It's in a, a Greek tradition that the King James and New King James are based on. Uh, just a couple extra words there. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, which is imminent, right? The end is at hand. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, blessed you are, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. We're going to get to that word. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time, the end is near, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This was our epistle lesson for the first, second Sunday after Christmas, so January 3rd, or whatever that was, we had this lesson. Martin Franzman, again, uh, opening this section, says, The approaching end alerts Christians to see their suffering both as sharing in the suffering of Christ, and therefore a guarantee of their participation in his glory, and also the sign and dawn of the approaching judgment. And so suffering does both those things. It unites us to Christ's suffering, but it is also the sign that this is the end times. Verse 12, do not be surprised at the fiery trial. Uh, this could be literal and figurative as well, right? Peter is writing somewhere around the time of Nero's persecution, and one of the most common ways that Nero persecuted Christians was to uh, put them on crosses and light it on fire to light his garden at night. So Peter may be talking very specifically about fire, or it could just be the figurative sense that we even use the word for, fiery trial meaning very intense. Do not be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Uh, the, half the whole last section, three whole chapters, talked about how we are strangers and aliens in this world. And so now he's kind of flipping that language around and saying, this treatment is not strange. We are strangers in this world. The world will treat us this way. That's what he's doing with that strangeness. We are to be strange or exiles and aliens in the world. How the world treats us is this way, this persecution and suffering. So don't be surprised. It's not strange. This is how it's going to be. And instead of being bewildered, rejoice! Right? It's not just grin and bear it bitterly, but rejoice! Insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. 
So rejoice, rejoice and be glad. He repeats multiple times in these verses. Uh, we as Christians need to ask ourselves if we are ready to, ready and able to do that, to rejoice amid suffering. That's a personal question. You have to ask yourself, examine yourself, uh, both in the sufferings you have personally, and then if there are grander persecutions and suffering that are brought on us from outside of ourselves, are we prepared to rejoice in those times? Uh, we Lutherans have a long history of that. Just look through our hymnal. And particularly the, uh, used to be called the cross and comfort section of the hymnal. Now I think in LSB it's the hope and comfort section of the hymnal. A lot of Lutheran hymns that sing with rejoicing amid suffering and trials. Uh, Paul Gerhardt, Rejoice My Heart, Be Glad and Sing. Great title, right? Read the rest of it. Oh, there's a lot of suffering there. Uh, even our, uh, our hymn of the day today, When in the Hour of Deepest Need, the, uh, the author of that hymn, when he was a, a high school lad, was returning from school, was thrown from his horse and dragged for over a mile, leaving him permanently disabled. But he still became a theologian and a pastor. He actually served in Wittenberg after Luther's pastor retired. So the, the pastor of Wittenberg during the Reformation was uh, Johannes Bugenhagen, who had the coolest last name ever. And then after he retires, Paul Eber, the author of this hymn, he becomes that uh, pastor in that office at that church. Um, so he knew suffering. Like I said, he was permanently disabled. He writes that hymn while the Turks are invading Hungary and their own land is undergoing pestilence. So, pretty serious time. And uh, from then on, it's, it's continued to be sung even in times of war. Uh, there's a, a couple stories of it being sung by uh, German villages being besieged. Any Swedish descendants in the crowd? Anybody here with Swedish descent? Terrible, terrible. The Swedes constantly were uh, attacking German provinces. And uh, in one particularly bad battle, uh, this poor German town was being just assailed. The, their village was on fire, and hailstorm was falling on them too. The women and children, it was in the middle of December, the women and children are hiding in the forest. A pastor gets a choir of 12 boys together, and they march into the Swedish camp singing that hymn, When in the Hour of Deepest Need, We Know Not Where to Turn for He marches these 12 boys into the military camp, right up to the general, who recognizes the pastor from school and gets up and hugs him and stops the siege. Right? So we Lutherans have a great history of singing powerful hymns and rejoicing in the midst of just, imagine your house is on fire and it's hailing, which kind of, hard, it's hard to put out the fire when you've got big hailstones falling on you. But they know that they, they are not being punished by God. They trust in God, and so they sing to him, and they even march into the enemy camp singing hymns. A similar story with uh, the, the great hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. You can look up that story. Uh, it also averted a Swedish attack. There's a lot of, I mean, say what you will about the Swedes and their merciless attacks. They were softies when it came to singing. It, German village starts singing and the Swedes stop attacking. So, we need to recapture that. That willingness to rejoice and be glad in its sufferings. Knowing that we share with Christ's sufferings. It is participation in and with him who suffers for us. This is one of the biggest things that separates Christianity from all other religions. Our God is the only God who is actually willing to suffer in our place. He's the only God that suffers at all. No other God suffers. Maybe in the deep, deep, dark recesses of mythology where there's many gods, they inflict some suffering on each other. But in the more monotheistic religions, there's only one God who willingly suffers. So we should be willing to partake in that with him. All right, verse 13 again. Uh, be glad when his glory is revealed. Literally, at the revelation of his glory, at the apocalypse. The Greek word apocalypse just means revelation. Uh, so when he is revealed, there will be glory. And so we can rejoice and be glad now, knowing that is coming. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Now why? When are we blessed if we're insulted here and now? When does that happen? We are insulted very often for the name of Christ, but the blessing comes 
at his returning glory. We will not often hear, hear much glory here and now. Verse 15, as we've seen before, he lists a number of different sins and says, don't, come on guys, get with the program, don't get, don't get punished for one of these things. A murderer, a thief, an evildoer, and equally as bad, a meddler. Anybody here meddle in other people's affairs? You're as bad as an adulterer, a thief, and a murderer. A meddler. The word there is a very, uh, very cool Greek word. It's alotrio episkopos. It's uh, it literally a bishop of someone else's affairs. Right. So the the word that we get bishop from in Greek is episkopos. Sounds a lot like episcopal, the episcopacy, the, the hierarchy. So it's literally bishoping over another person, or a more longer definition, inserting yourself into someone else's affairs outside of your office outside of your calling. Uh, not just in reference to parishioners and pastors, pastors and parishioners, but you know, fellow parents and neighbors in different offices. Yeah, stop meddling in someone else's affairs. It's just as bad as adultery, thievery, and murder. So if you do that, you are rightly punished. You are rightly to suffer for that. Right? If you are a meddler, you will have no friends, and that suffering is not because of the name of Christ. It's because you are an alotrio episcopos bishoping over somebody else's affairs. Verse 16, instead of that, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Right, so instead of being ashamed, what are Christians to do? Sing the doxology. Praise God. So we're not ashamed to be, you know, if the, if the outside world wants to mock us for monogamy, we're going to glorify God for that. If they want to mock us for having, you know, big families, as they do, if you have more than three kids, the world mocks you and calls you names, uh, thanks be to God, I'll gladly glorify God with my children. Right, this is just what Christians do. When the world mocks you for things that are in accord with God's name and are directly associated with his name, we give thanks to God for it. We praise him. Luther says... When you suffer in this way, you should not blush. No, you should praise God. Here he makes suffering and pain precious, so that it is so important that we should praise God for it, since we are not worthy of this suffering. Today, however, everybody shrinks from it. I must put his suffering into my heart. Then I have the true treasure. St. Peter's bones are sacred, but what does that help you? You and your own bones must become sacred. And this happens when you suffer for Christ's sake. Right, so we have to take a different approach to our own suffering. Well, Versus, it would yeah. be just as well as COVID right now as the church is shut down by so much by government at times. I would have been somewhat drawn, I would think, out of this at times. Where I think what they're going through is a lot worse than what we've yeah. got. Well, they're also, yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways in which the church is mocked and, and treated like fools and idiots and even just uh, the difference between, you know, World War II era, where churches were viewed as essential in government terms, essential for the, even just on human terms, for the morale that they can keep boosted. We know that it's more than that spiritually. To have the sacrament and the forgiveness of sins uh, brought to people, that is vital. But, you know, 50 years, 70 years later, no, not essential. It's just kind of a hobby for you nut jobs on the side. No, it's, it's essential, spiritually. The, the spiritual matters. Verse 17. It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Uh, so this is the testing and trying that God sends upon his church and allows to befall his church as part of his good and gracious will. In some ways, to purge the church. To purify the church. One of the things that God uses suffering and hard times for, corporately rather than individually, when he does it corporately, part of the job is to purify the church. That the hypocrites who do not actually believe and do not value Christ for his word will typically fall away in times of trial. Think of the parable of the sower and those who are scorched under the heat when times get tough. 
God himself allows such trials to happen in part to purify his church, to refine it, right? The refining fire. This has happened throughout every era of church history that when there is persecution or great suffering, the church gets smaller but is incredibly stronger, right? Smaller but stronger because a lot of the dross has been burned away. And that's a very hard thing to think about as we as a church go through the COVID era and, and look at you know, the Equality Act that was passed by the House but won't be passed by the Senate, God willing. Uh, it can get worse for Christians, and that is a humbling thing. We still need to rejoice and be glad when there is suffering, but we also need to redouble our efforts to pray and to try to strengthen the weak and wavering among us. Because we know what this does. It does thin out the church. And that's not good for their sake. Right? For you who are faithful and trusting in Christ even in the hardest times, you can rejoice and be glad, but thinking also of those who are wavering, if not falling away. Right? Thread there, and then the fiery trial snaps the thread. This image of the, of the judgment beginning in God's house is a long-standing Old Testament one. That God begins his judgment with his own people. It's in Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Amos and Zechariah. It's in Malachi as well. Uh, the best one that's closest to this wording is Jeremiah 25. Let's turn there. Jeremiah 25, verse 29. speaking here at verse 29, For behold, I begin to work disaster at the city that is called by my name, and shall go, er, and shall you go unpunished. You shall not go unpunished, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. Right, so there is the, the prediction of the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians, where God himself says, I'm beginning this judgment, will you all go escape, all of Judah, the land outside the city? No, you, will, you too will be judged for the idolatry they had committed. Verse 17 goes on, if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel? Right, begin, judgment begins in the household of God, but it includes all the earth. So then he quotes, quotes Proverbs 11, if the righteous is scarcely saved, Right? It's only by God's grace, and it's a, a, narrow, a narrow salvation. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Few find it, says our Lord. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's do, in 1 Peter, let's go back to chapter 2 to see how Peter describes Jesus. And that will help us tie together the, the suffering of Christ and the suffering of Christians into this doing good. 1 Peter 2, verse 23. Speaking of Jesus, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And now here Peter says, we too entrust ourselves to a faithful creator. He doesn't have to refer to him as the one who judges justly. He's already done that before, and we're talking about the judgment. But who is it who judges us? The faithful creator. Right? The God who created heaven and earth. Uh, we entrust our souls to him while doing good. Right? Lutherans know, and our Lutheran confessions say it, good works are necessary. They are not uh, necessary unto salvation as if we are saved by works, but good works will always necessarily follow faith. Right? Saving faith will always produce works. So that's the end of chapter 4. Chapter 5 next week will, will be a, an even further call to sobriety and good works while resisting the devil. Uh, and also a little... Uh, clear admonition to the pastors in those five regions of Asia Minor. Bill.
I probably should have brought this up earlier. I was surprised that the word agape didn't come up in the early part of our study here today. Many of us were pretty well educated in the definition of that word from our previous class. Yes, agape, the, for, the, uh, the word for love. Let me check and make sure that's the word that's used, because there are a couple others. Yeah, we start with verse 12, agape toy, beloved, beloved, uh, do not be surprised. We're look, you're looking at verse 11, though, we're back earlier, right? Yes. Verse 8. Yep, it is there twice, both the verb and the noun form. Yeah, so amongst the different Greek words for love, agape, or agapao in the verb form, is the one for sacrificial love. Uh, it's used almost exclusively that way in the New Testament. Outside of the New Testament, the Greek literature doesn't use that word for love very often, at least not with that powerful of a meaning. Uh, but it is the, the love of sacrifice, the love of doing what's right, even if it's harmful to you. It's different than phileo, which we did see earlier, brotherly love, was also used in 1 Peter, that brotherly love, that's the philos word, and then there's uh, eros, a more erotic love, that's where we get the word erotic. So those are the different types of love. Yeah, and It is called here agape, to suffer for one another as love. Thank you for bringing that up. I don't know how much Greek you guys have learned. I know you've learned a lot of Hebrew. Keep working on us. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, prepare us to suffer for your name's sake, that we be not ashamed, but rejoice uh, to join with Christ, that as he has suffered for us, we would suffer for and with one another to the glory of your name and for the salvation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Have a great day.